What do you know about surf music? It's kind of a weird question, I know, because it was only invented as recently as 94 thanks to Tarantino. I'm kidding, of course. But it is still a weird question to ask, namely because it's so darn niche. I mean, it's mostly relegated to just a footnote when we discuss music history at large. But when we narrow the scope, it's still mostly just a footnote. And why is that? I mean, it had its moment in the sun. But nobody seems to remember it anymore. At least, nobody draws that much inspiration from it. Right? <laughs> Wrong! Obviously, contemporary surf artists are still out there. But before I jump the gun, it would probably be helpful to define what exactly we're talking about when we talk about surf music. In this regard, I'm mostly keeping to David Brackett's definition, as defined in his book, The Pop, Rock, and Soul Reader. According to Brackett, there were essentially two schools when it came to surf. One being the school of heavy guitars led by artists like Dick Dale and the Ventures, and the other being a vocal style led by the Beach Boys, a band that, in his words, developed a distinctive contrapuntal falsetto-led style. According to Brackett, these two schools were a product of a time when, in his words, the American imagination increasingly shifted westward to the land of fruit and nuts, as California rapidly became the most populous and economically important of the 50 states. He then goes on to attribute the genesis of surf music to Californian suburbia. I'm inclined to agree with Brackett here. I think that surf music's popularity was due in part to suburban teenagers being bored. Unfortunately for surf musicians, they couldn't ride that wave of popularity for much longer. They had a little thing called the British Invasion to contend with, and the British put a bit of a beatdown on them. There are rumors around that this is Britain's revenge for the Boston Tea Party. 3,000 screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. Bands like the Beatles, Stones, the Kinks, and the Who would halt much of Surf's momentum as teenagers shifted their attention. 64, the same year the Beatles arrived at Kennedy Airport, would mark the beginning of Dick Dale's nearly 30-year studio album hiatus. And 66 saw a marked departure from the Beach Boys' older sound in favor of a more eclectic direction with their album Pet Sounds. <laughs> New York City cops are hard-pressed protecting the Beatles at their hotel. Virtually no surf act in the U.S. was spared from this fate either. Quick examples include the Surfaris, who disbanded their original lineup in 65 and would only go on to release live albums and compilations. And the Ventures, another example, would find a niche by touring in Japan long after surf's heyday was over. So hopefully now you understand why musicologists and historians tend to relegate surf to just a footnote, even when they're contemplating the history of rock and pop in North America. It's very easy to dismiss the style as a passing fad, a style that enjoyed popularity for a couple years in the early 60s, and then died just as quick as it had come to prominence. Kind of like dubstep in the summer of 2010. Anyway, you've probably guessed by now that the reductive narrative of the British invasion killing off surf music is exactly that, a reductive narrative. For my money, the British invasion didn't kill surf, but it did put it into a bit of a comatose state. For a while, it lied dormant, just kind of waiting for a new generation of musicians to do something with it. As luck would have it, that day finally came in the late 70s and early 80s. Out of the ashes of the Californian surf scene, the subgenre surf punk was born. In 1981, Agent Orange released their debut album, and they tipped their hat in Dick Dale's direction with their cover of Miserloo, a song that Dale had helped to popularize around 20 years earlier. Other classic cuts from this album include Bloodstains, a song beloved by both skaters and surfers alike. Agent Orange was as much punk as it was surf, however. This much can be ascertained by their heavier sound and their themes of dissatisfaction and irreverence. The lyrics to the aforementioned bloodstains, for example, are as follows. Now they make things worse for me. Sometimes I'd rather die. They can tell me lots of things, but I don't see eye to eye. Well, I know they know the way I think. I know they always will. But someday I'm going to change my mind. Sometimes I'd rather kill. Bloodstains, speed kills, fast cars, cheap thrills. Surely it was enough for some parents to say, 
Turn off that crap -orama. A contemporary of Agent Orange was the aptly named Surf Punks, who embraced a more new wave sound. They still had all the irreverence one would expect from punk, however, while at the same time singing about many beachy subjects like shark attacks, water sports, lifeguards, being born to surf, and struggling to pick up beach girls. As a side note, one of the founding members, Dennis Dragon, was the brother of Daryl Dragon, a keyboardist for the Beach Boys. I gotta level with you. Uh, this is just goofy as hell. One final example of a band in the realm of surf punk is the Forgotten Rebels out of Ontario, Canada. They didn't incorporate surf quite as heavily as the aforementioned bands, but their satirical ways eventually led them to write songs like Surfing on Heroin, which was essentially a gritty caricature of the original sterile suburban spirit that gave rise to a lot of early surf music to begin with. In short, the late 70s and early 80s laid the groundwork for fusion genres that utilized surf music with more contemporary styles. A consequence of this was the marrying of a sound to an image that surf never originally intended. You could say that this opened Pandora's box, as more and more surf bands from the US and around the world started to use pastiche in this way. This eventually led to a surf rock revival by the 1990s. To be fair to Tarantino, this revival was due in part to the success of Pulp Fiction. His inclusion of tracks like Miserloo, Bustin' Surfboards, and Surfrider caused a renewed interest in the genre. Consequently, the film's release would prove to be a bit of a windfall both for surf bands that formed prior to its release and those that would come immediately after. To be clear, I'm using the word surf as a bit of a shorthand here, because by the 90s it had already become a gumbo of everything that had happened in the last 30 years. Circling back to pastiche and the marrying of a sound to an image that Surf never originally intended, you had bands like Manor Astroman, who married their brand of Surf to images of space travel. The Finnish band Leica and the Cosmonauts had a similar idea with their brand of space travel surf. Oh, man, oh man! Okay, everybody, Viva Low Straight Jacket is the new album for my next guest. We're going to be appearing tomorrow night at Twist and Shout in Bethesda, Maryland. Please welcome back to the show one of our very favorites, Low Straight Jackets! <laughs> One final example that comes to mind is Los Straightjackets, who married their brand of surf to images of masked wrestlers. I could go on naming you weird combos of surf and strange images that you wouldn't normally associate with surf until we're blue in the face, but the main point is this. Surf could be married to any image you wanted. Now that we've discussed some of the historical context for surf music, I can start to talk to you about a band called Daikaiju. They're a surf rock band that formed in 1999 in Huntsville, Alabama. At first blush, the American South certainly doesn't seem like it would have a role to play in the innovation of surf music. But as we discussed, when surf is considered more of a spice rather than a dogmatic genre, the result is often bands from all over the world that marry their sound to any image or geographical location that they want. In fact, that last part about geographical location is particularly important in Daikaiju's case. You see, Daikaiju married their sound to a type of 60s nostalgia. It's just not US-based. Daikaiju the band lays into Daikaiju the imagery quite heavily, 
between their album artwork and their song titles, there are many allusions to the movie genre. The word itself, daikaiju, roughly translates into large, strange monster in Japanese. Some classic monsters from the genre include Godzilla, Mothra, Gamera, Rodan, and more recently it's led to another King Kong vs. Godzilla remake. Some track titles that seem to express their appreciation for the movie genre include Attack of the Crab Women, Farewell to Monster Island, The Trouble with Those Mothra Girls, and Spiral Serpent Strike. Another obvious use of Japanese imagery is their use of kabuki theater masks. However, unlike kabuki theater, the band members never actually speak when they're on stage, and they adopt aliases. Their most recent personnel on their latest album, for example, was Secret Man, Rock Man, Rumble Man, and Hands Man. I can't quite tell you why I find this band so fascinating. I suppose the short answer is that we're often drawn to things we find bizarre. I think this is a rather simplistic answer, though. In reality, I think they've captured something special sonically and branding-wise that can only have come from reviving a 60s genre in the 90s, utilizing foreign monster movies as part of your image, developing stage names, covering your face, shredding hard, and lighting things on fire for good measure. Many a Reddit threads discuss how lively Daikaiju are as a band when they play live, and I really think you should check out their music. <laughs>